let's start. Um, when are you recording? Okay. So um, welcome to this week's uh, CISA IFPU seminar. Our speaker today is Maximiliano Easy, who also likes Max, as he just told us. He's currently a postdoc at MIT, uh, NASA Einstein fellow, and he's also associated with the Fred Darwin Institute in New York. Uh, he obtained his PhD in Caltech, and he is well known for his tests of general relativity using gravitational wave observations coming from LIGO and Virgo. This is also the topic that he will address today. Uh, we're very happy that you accepted our invitation and we're looking forward to your talk. You have around 45 minutes. There is no sharp cut uh, in time. Uh, stage is yours. Great, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I've been in LIGO for eight, nine years now. I don't even know. And this is a topic that continues to amaze me. I mean, there's new developments and well, new detections, of course, coming in. It's a very exciting field. So I hope I can share some of that enthusiasm with you if you're not already on this on this boat. So I have um, three main goals for today, more or less. I mean, the first one is going to be to very briefly survey this state of the program and the status of what it means to test general relativity with gravitational waves in practice and what the overall um, status of the measurements is. There's a little lightning bolt there just to remind me to tell you like, it's not going to be a comprehensive review. It's a big area. And so I'm just gonna cherry pick two or three topics that I really like, and then I'll give you references or I can ask, uh, you can ask me questions later about the rest. Um, because then I'm going to focus primarily on first parameterized tests of the dynamics of the source, uh, like PN, post-Newtonian coefficients, as an excuse to tell you about the problem of how to combine multiple observations to make um, cohesive statements about, uh, about testing GR with gravitational waves. So not just one signal, but many signals. How do you actually do that properly? Um, and then I will pivot to talk about uh, particularly ring down studies, which I find personally to be one of the most exciting uh, topics. And we have had a lot of recent developments about that that I would like to contextualize. Um, all right, so to get started from, from the beginning, I guess, what does it mean to test general relativity with LIGO and Virgo? Well, I mean, just the mere fact that we're detecting gravitational waves with general relativistic templates as we do, it's in some sense a validation of the theory, um, but we can do better than that, really, because general relativity makes very specific predictions about what LIGO and Virgo should see. Um, and in my mind, I'd like to split those into two camps who may disagree with me, but I'd like to think about this first in terms of the overall, the predictions of the overall um, the radiation uh, independently of what the source is. So things like the speed, should the, the gravitational wave should travel at the speed of light, the lack of dispersion, the wave packets should not dis disperse, um, the fact that only two polarizations are allowed in general relativity. These are very broad, basic fundamental statements that uh, GR makes that we can check. Uh, and then there's specific predictions for any given source any, let's say a pair of black holes or a pair of neutrons or whatever, a supernova, what, what the specific phasing of the gravitational wave that we should see should be. Um, and so that is probing slightly different uh, physics or conceptually slightly different. Um, in the end, this is really an artificial description. What we do in any case is just to compare a model for what we should see, a model for the stretching and the squeezing in the interferometer arms and try to contrast that to the data that we actually see and try to see if there's any significant deviation. And if so, where is that coming from? And then we can interpret that in different ways. Um, but it is important to keep in mind that in LIGO world, when we say testing general relativity, it's really a shorthand for testing our model of everything that's going on. And that, of course, it does include general relativity because all our predictions are uh, based on, on the theory, but it also includes any approximations that are um, used in order to derive the prediction from Einstein's equations efficiently. Um, this may include like a given waveform approximant or whatnot. 
Um, there are also assumptions that go into any given analysis about the specific source that we're looking at, what the nature of the system is, the specific priors that we apply. Um, and then importantly, and sometimes forgotten, are assumptions about the instrument that go into the analysis. All of these analysis I'm going to talk about fall assumptions about the instrument as well, implicitly. So things like the statistical behavior of the noise, and the calibration status of the instrument. All of this together, you package it into our model, and it's what uh, it makes up our null hypothesis that, that we test when we do these analyses. So an example statement for what the thing we test for is what we're assuming the null case is a signal from a non-eccentric binary black hole within general relativity in stationary Gaussian noise of a well-calibrated detector. Um, and so if we do at some point observe something that smells wrong, that it's a deviation of some kind, then we'll have to go back and examine each of these independently. If you don't see any evidence, you can say, we don't see evidence for any of these things being broken, so that's good. If you see a deviation, then you have to make sure to rule out instrument issues and so on. So it's, this is true for any measurement, but it's good to keep in mind. Um, okay, so we've been doing this for a long, for, well, since the first detection, 1509-14, um, but at this point we have accumulated almost 50 detections, depending exactly how you count, and we've been doing this for uh, the vast majority of them. The latest version of our um, catalog, our latest catalog is GWTC2 that compiles all of the, the published uh, the detections. And there's a link there to this paper, which you probably already have seen. And there's also an accompanying dedicated paper about testing GR with all of these signals. And um, this means all of the signals we've detected up to this point. So these catalogs are comprehensive. So it goes from 15 and 14 up to the, the last, the, the first half of the last um, observing run, the third observing run. Um, this paper, testing GR, the testing GR companion paper, I will tell you a little bit about, was actually published finally, like two days ago, three days ago. Uh, so you'll see it in PRD. Um, there's a lot of rich stuff in there. It's a long paper. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that this is really about the black holes from this from the second LIGO Virgo transient catalog. We have not carried out um, a test of general relativity with neutron stars since the first neutron star, 1708-17. Um, and there's a whole set of specific analyses that we can do in that case, especially because we had an electromagnetic counterpart, things to do with the speed of gravity, gravitational waves, and um, things like that that are very important that I will not talk about unless you ask me at the end. So from now on, I will focus on black holes. Um, and then in this paper, you will find, well, not only just quantitative improvements over previous constraints, factors of 2, 2.6, um, improved constraints on the mass of the graviton that surpassed some of the solar system constraints. You will also find new material like analysis, dedicating analysis of the ring downs and um, new ways of, of actually interpreting a batch of detections. Now, this is going to be a main theme here is we have a large number of detections. How do we make sure we are, uh, they are consistent statistically with the prediction? Um, okay, so roughly speaking, um, this, I mean, if you really want to know what the status of the field is, I point you to this reference, um, where you will see this large number of tests carried out on, on, on the signals that we look at. And in LIGO and Virgo, we'd like to split these into these categories. So first, there's the overall broad uh, set of tests. Uh, looking at the consistency of the of the data with GR without very being very specific. So things like looking at the statistical properties of the residuals or consistency between different parts of the signal when analyzed independently in spiral merger ring down consistency. Then there's, there's targeted searches uh, for deviations in the source dynamics, which I will tell you about the, the, like post-Newtonian coefficients or similar. Uh, and that includes now in this case, uh, in this paper for the first time, a targeted analysis for the spin-induced quadruple moment. Um, finally, we have an probes of the remnant through the ring down and searches for records. And there's uh, constraints on dispersion, including the mass of the graviton 
and um, the polarization content as well. So we we need to categorize this in this sort of arbitrary way. In reality, all these things overlap conceptually, but also in practice. Um, you know, something that would show up in a test for dispersion will also show up, could also show up in residuals tests, so could also show up. So um, all of these things overlap in very complicated ways, but they are philosophically uh, distinct. But it's good to keep in mind that in practice, this is all a very complex network of analyses. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, you, you this is a lot of stuff. You should feel free if you're specifically interested in any of, of these, you should feel free to ask me, but I will really just talk about these two, starting with the parameterized deviations of the source uh, that as I mentioned, I will take as an excuse to tell you about um, the problem of combining information from multiple sources. Um, okay, so the sources that we're talking about here, as I mentioned, is um, non-eccentric uh, binary black holes will leave the neutron star aside. And the kind of evolution for this, uh, this kind of source that we expect is that early on, we have two black holes that are far away and they're evolving essentially adiabatically and slowly spiraling into each other. Eventually they plunge, they merge, and we're left with a final black hole that rings down uh, its excitations and eventually settles. So the initial, uh, the initial portion uh, of this process is the spiral. We can map these, these three sort of regimes conceptually into the waveform that we see. This is, the, this is the signal we would see in our detector. And early on, roughly speaking, should correspond to the black holes far apart. Eventually there's a plunge and the, the, the final region corresponds to the ringing of the final black hole. The easiest, well, the two extremes are easier to describe than the middle part. The spiral part, we can describe uh, as a series expansion in the orbital velocity of the two objects, or equivalently as uh, powers of the frequency of the Fourier frequency using, um, you can think of it as Kepler, Kepler's laws. And so we can get an expression for the phasing of this gravitational wave uh, in terms of V over C, for example, as you see here. Um, and you have initially some base uh, baseline uh, term that gives the expression that you will get from the quadruple formula. And it's essentially depends on this combination of the masses, which is the, the chirp mass. Then there's a next order correction uh, that depends on the mass ratio. In, in general relativity, there's no, um, this term is zero, but anyhow. Um, and then at higher orders, you have the spins of the two components uh, starting to make an, an, an effect on, on the phasing and so on. As you go to higher and higher orders, you're eventually probing more nonlinear, closer to nonlinear effects. And so you have these logarithmic terms, for example, that uh, are representative. Um, they arise from gravitational wave tails and other cool effects that are really characteristic to GR. So if, you, we, if we are able to probe this structure, if we're able to constrain these terms and actually get to especially this later part, we're really probing some interesting dynamics and trying to um, and gain an observational picture into, into dynamical gravity that we can't get otherwise. So the idea behind these parameterized tests is, well, in general relativity, or when we produce a waveform a prediction for, for um, our regular analyses, all of these things are just, uh, they are fixed given the masses and the spins and so on of, of the system. So we can add additional freedom. So for each of these phi i's, the, the coefficients in this expansion, these would have a predicted value in general relativity. We can add a perturbation around that um, given by this delta phi hat. Um, and then we can try to measure those from the data like we do the masses or anything else. Uh, and then in the end, this uh, these phi i's really are corrections to the waveform that goes uh, go as a power of i to the minus five over three, and that's what you're correcting the Fourier um, facing of the of, of the gravitational wave. Anyhow, that's a lot of talk to say to sort of give you an idea of how we can um, use the detail facing of the gravitational wave to try to constrain um, deviations in the orbital facing of the um, in the orbital dynamics of the source which could be could depart from GR if there are extra fields or other mechanisms that affect the binary. 
Um, so that's sort of very well established for the Inspira regime. If you're feeling bold, you can uh, generalize this idea to the intermediate plunge and merger ring down regimes by adding these phenomenological parameters that we call beta and alpha. And the, the reason you can do that is that in LIGO Virgo world, we have uh, phenomenological models that um, describe the full the full extent of the waveform, not just the spiral. So from the spiral, this this part is it's well defined. You can do it as I said, as you can think of it as an expansion powers of V over C. Uh, for here, and it, technically for this part, you need um, numerical relativity for the intermediate uh, nonlinear part. Um, but you we can write down uh, ansatz analytic ansatz that we can tune to these uh, numerical relativity simulations. And then those have degrees of freedom that we can perturb and these betas and alphas come from that essentially. Uh, so we have these parameters that control the spiral intermediate and merger ring down uh, regimes and we can measure those from the data. So here it is, the uh, latest and greatest uh, measurements of, of the orbital dynamics from GWTC2. So what I'm showing you here is um, the phi's that I just talked about. The only parameter that I hadn't shown is this phi minus two parameter that really just corresponds to a, an f to the minus seven thirds correction to the Fourier frequency. And it's something that you might expect as a leading order correction if there's dipole radiation in the binary, for example. So we can correct, uh, we can look for that as well. And then on the right, you have these betas and alpha parameters, phenomenological parameters that control the merger and the ring down. Um, okay, so each of each little horizontal bar represents a given event, and the color is uh, representative of the mass of the system. Red means heavier, and blue means lighter events. And you will see that the constraints for these um, merger ring down parameters are dominated by the heavier events, and the opposite is true for the uh, lower PN coefficients that are mainly dominated by the lighter events. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that, uh, that these corrections go, go as this power of the frequency. Uh, and effectively, these coefficients are affecting the early part of the spiral, which we see better for lighter events. And for the, the red coefficients here, they control the merger ring down, which we see better for heavier events. So you see that, that play, play here directly. Um, okay, so we have all these events and we can, uh, assuming the deviation is the same for all of the events, we can combine them to produce um, a joint upper bound. I guess I should say this is a 90% upper limit on the, on the deviation from the GR value. So we want this to be low to be general relativity. So if you combine all of these in some way that I will talk about next, um, you can obtain tighter constraints. So you see this is lower than the individual events. Um, we can do this. We have different ways of approximating the, the waveform from, from general relativity. So this, these results are obtained using what we call the um, phenom P V2 approximant is one way of obtaining the waveform from GR. You can also use a different method that is called um, SOB from equivalent one body dynamics. And that gives you similar results, but it's a good check for systematics. Um, you can compare that to the previous bounds that we had in GWTC1, the previous catalog. And you'll see that overall, we have improved these constraints roughly by factors of two or so. Um, and if you want, you can also compare those to the similar constraints that are obtained were obtained for the binary neutron star back when that happened. Um, so you see, in general, we're doing way better than what we did with the binary neutron star, uh, except for the lower PN coefficients that really are gaining from the very long in spiral that we saw for the binary neutron star. And so, especially for the dipole, that's still the best constraint from, from, from LIGO and Virgo. There are other constraints from pulsars, for example, that are way lower than this. Um, all right, so what I want to turn to now so this is very interesting and you, you can translate these constraints into specific theories that will predict deviations of different PN orders and so on. Um, but I, what I'm interested in uh, here is to tell you about what it means to actually produce these joint results. 
Um, what we do in this plot is sort of a trick. It, it, well, it's a shortcut where whereby we assume that each event will have the same value. Will, will this par each parameter will take the same value for all events. And if you do that, it's straightforward to produce these combined results. But it is a very restrictive assumption, right? So in general relativity, these coefficients do take the same param the same value for all events because they are zero for all, right? The fractional deviation from general relativity is zero for any for all of the events. And so that's true. But once you are outside general relativity, if you want to leave the comfort of, of the theory, um, then you don't no longer know that that's true. I mean, the, per, the, the, the value of the PN coefficient of any given PN coefficient could depend on the mass of the system or on the on or its environment or its spins. I don't know. It, it, it could be a function of some unknown quantity or some length scale that the theory imposes that we don't know. So if you are trying to obtain constraints for deviations from general relativity, you can't assume that all of the events that you're looking at have the same value of these parameters, unless you're working in a specific theory where you know that to be true. But here we're trying to be generic. Um, we don't know what the, if, if it's not GR, we don't know what it is. And so we, we should be as generic as possible. So how do you actually extract information from a big set of observations, which is the problem we have now, right? It's an embarrassment of riches. We have too many signals and we struggle to make sense of them. There are ways of doing that. There's one way I know of that, um, at least the only way I know of, which is to borrow techniques from our astrophysics colleagues who do uh, who study the populations of black holes, their distributions of masses and spins and whatnot. And they have solved this problem. Uh, well, on the ast astro statistics, people have solved this problem many, many times. Um, and, and it's actually quite, quite simple once you wrap your head around it. So the idea is that we will say, well, we don't know what the true value for each, each event is. So in a Bayesian philosophy, we'll just model them as drawn from some unknown distribution, right? So let's say um, the minus one PN coefficient for 15 or 914, the true value that we don't know is, is drawn from some unknown distribution. And for each event, that's true. Uh, and then we can parameterize that distribution and try to measure its parameters from the whole set of events at once. So see, this is different because now instead of analyzing one signal at a time, we are essentially analyzing the whole set at once and extracting some information about the probable distribution of those unknown parameters. Okay, so in general, let's imagine you have a parameter X that you measure for a given event and you get some probability distribution like this. So this is the probability for X given the data for this first event. And hopefully somewhere in there is the true value for that event, which we don't know, right? We, we're, we don't have access to the truth. Um, if this was, a, test, uh, uh, if this, if this was a, a parameter in this context of testing GR and, and GR is correct, the value would be zero, let's say, but we don't, we're not assuming that, so we don't know. Uh, so this true value um, is, well, it's intrinsic to that event. We don't know what it is. And there's one for each of the events that we look at. For each of those events, we have a measurement like this on the right, which I'm not showing. So there's n distributions like this, all slightly different. Uh, and so we're from, from each of those, we can try to infer what the true value is that we are going to assume is drawn from some distribution that is the mystery distribution that we don't know. So saying it backwards, it's like imagine God just knows what the true distribution is of these parameters. He draws the true parameters uh, for each event. And we don't observe those, we observe some noisy version. So the goal is to try to reconstruct from the distribution on the right, the distribution, the meta distribution on the left. So if you haven't thought about this before, it may sound kind of convoluted, but in, in reality, in the end, what we do is we say, well, let's just assume the simplest possible shape of this distribution, which is a normal with some mean and standard deviation. And we can measure that mean and standard deviation from the collection of noisy data. Um, in the case of testing general relativity, the prediction of general relativity is that this distribution is a delta 
function because all of the events should have val should have zero deviation. Uh, and so that's a delta function at zero. So the prediction that we're trying to test now is, is this distribution a delta function or not? So is mu and sigma consistent with zero? Okay, so I hope that was not too much to parse, but anyway, I'm just gonna repeat some of that. So um, because the deviations from general relativity are likely to affect each system differently, we can't do the simple thing uh, of the simple method of multiplying likelihoods or base factors, which is what you can do when you assume it's the same value for all the events. Um, instead, we model the distribution of observations. So say the minus one PN coefficient, this delta phi minus two parameter for the nth event, we will assume there's some mu and some standard deviation that controls the distribution of the true values for these parameters. And we will measure that from the events. And so this is for the minus two, uh, the minus one PN coefficient. Uh, we do that for each of those coefficients. So in the end, what we will have is a distribution, uh, a measurement of the mu and sigma for each of those delta phi's that I showed you before, and the delta alphas and betas, if you want. Okay, so that's what I'm showing you now on the right, which is the actual measurement from um, the catalog. This is the first time that we did that, by the way, with uh, with Ligon Virgo. And, and so what you see is mu on the x-axis and sigma on the y-axis. The color is each of these coefficients, you know, phi minus two, this is a minus one PN coefficient, it's the best constrained one, so we scale it by a factor of 20, um, and that's this, and, and so on, phi, phi, whatever, the different PN orders. Uh, and so you see that this is a 90% credible contour, and they all include zero and zero, which is the GR prediction. So this is just it's a statement that the whole population of measurements is consistent with all of these parameters being zero for all of the events, which is what we want. But we're not assuming that restrictive assumption that they have to take the same value. Um, okay, so I find this to be very neat and it's very important because now we have order 50, 30, 50 detections, we will have hundreds. And so we need smart ways of doing this without bias. If you don't do this, you'll get biases. Um, okay, there's a different way of representing the same measurement I just showed you, which oh, I think I hit that slide. Oh, well, anyway, uh, this, um, which is from those posterior, so mu and sigma, you can actually predict a, this, a likely distribution of values that it looks more like what we usually are used to seeing. And so this is the same measurement cast in a different way. Um, the color distributions corresponds to what you get, not assuming that all values are shared. And the gray distributions are what you would get if you incorrectly assumed, well, or narrowly assumed that all of these events have the same value. So you see these distributions are tighter because it's a, it's a more constrained model, but you're, you're leaving out a bunch of possibilities in there. Okay, so thanks for indulging me in this statistics uh, uh, tour. Um, I guess the main point I wanna impress is that these are things that if you're interested in testing um, general relativity with several events in general, and you don't have a specific model of how each event should be affected, then you will have to take these things into account. Uh, so, Max, uh, regarding yeah. So why is the, the Gaussian distribution uh, chosen? Is it simply because it's a maximum entropy? Uh, yeah. There? yeah, great question. I didn't, I didn't really say that. Um, when you have sort of not a lot of events and not very loud, um, it's justified to say all I probably can measure is the mean and the standard deviation of whatever distribution the true distribution is that I don't know, whatever shape it has. And so you can always do that by fitting a Gaussian. So you can, you can think of this as a measurement of the mean and standard deviation of the true distribution, uh, whatever that may be. And in, in general, it will, so it's kind of like an expansion, like in distributions, it's kind of like an expansion in, in, a, in a series expansion, right? So then you can have higher terms that give you the kurtosis and different moments of the distribution. 
Um, so fitting a Gaussian is equivalent to saying, let's measure the mean and standard deviation. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be a Gaussian, but it is, um, it is because it's a maximum entropy. But to some extent, this depends. I, I understand this. So it, Gaussian is the, well, the simplest approximation for for a PDF, and, and mm -hmm. it's also, I mean, I guess a motivation for the maximum entropy principle. But to some extent, this depends on the parameterization that you you use, because I would rather expect, for instance, the dipole emission to be linked to the asymmetry, the mass asymmetry of your of your binary. That's what we, in mm -hmm. most theories that I know of. And the, the, the dipole emission is proportional to the, the mass difference or actually the charge difference. So maybe it would also make sense to, to try to, to combine together somehow events that have similar masses um, rather than yeah, assuming, uh, I mean, I see what you're doing here, but there must, there could be another way of combining events, which, uh, which is intermediate again between, uh, within the two, which is to, to to combine events that have similar masses because, and this would still be an agnostic way of doing things. You're not assuming much about the theory besides that binaries with similar masses behave in the same way. So you just assume that, that those parameters delta P are, are common to, so you, you could actually write this N of mu and sigma, I think you could write it as function of the masses and try to, to yeah, to come up with a, an agnostic way of parameterizing a function of the masses or, or chirp mass and mass ratio. Yeah, yeah. So this doesn't preclude that, right? Like if you have a model yeah. like yeah, that, that's right. an invalid intermediate thing in between the, the assuming it's all the same if respective. And, and this is the, this, what I'm saying here is that this is the most generic know, yeah, thing yeah. you could do. Then if you have, you know, you can inform this with physics and then you can do maybe better for some context, but you're putting in some more yeah, assumptions, you're, you're, which is fine. Yeah. You're using statistics only. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can show exactly, that's exactly the idea, right? Like we, like in general, these parameters will depend on the mass ratio or whatever, as you were saying, the difference in the charges. Or, or, and so this is just a, a very broad way of, of, you can show that if the true population has a dependence like that, in general, a, a, a generic if a generic modeling like this would catch that. Like it won't it won't tell you it depends on the masses, but it will tell you it's not a delta function at zero, which is the the zeroth order thing that we want to know here. Um, but then, yeah, if you have if you have more information about what's reasonable, you should feel free to add it there as a as a second pass. Uh, let's say so that's totally fine. Fine, but it's harder, right? Because you have to know. Uh, well, you have to know the theory better to actually know that and be sure that you're doing it right. So I trust you to do it. I don't trust me to do it. <laughs> okay, so um, this uh, sort of technique is very generic and powerful and we can apply it to the ring downs and we can apply it to basically anything where you're measuring a parameter that you're in this, in this situation where you don't know or you don't have a model that you really believe uh, like what Enrico just said, if you don't really trust your understanding of that, or you want to be as generic as possible, you will have to resort to these sort of hierarchical techniques. Uh, that in practice are actually very easy to run. I mean, we have code, like it runs very, it's not hard. It sounds harder than it is. Um, anyhow, so let me uh, take the last, uh, well, I see how long I can uh, talk, but uh, uh, I, I think ring downs have been one of the most exciting uh, sort of recent developments uh, in testing general relativity world, and it's what I really like. So let me tell you a bit more about what have been, we have been doing on that front. Um, well, as you know, uh, the well, as I mentioned, I guess the final the final part of the gravitational wave signals that we see correspond to the uh, vibrations of the uh, newly formed black hole, the remnant black hole. And this should be a superposition of quasi-normal modes with characteristic frequencies and damping times that you see here that are, in, that are intrinsic, um, that are representative of the intrinsic geometry of the space-time. So they will only depend on the black hole mass and spin or charge if it was a charged black hole. 
Um, and then these uh, quasi-normal modes are excited with some amplitude and phasing that depends on the nature of the excitation that got the, the perturbations uh, started. But I personally usually don't really care about the amplitudes. We really care about the frequencies and the damping rates that form the spectrum that tell us about um, the structure of the black hole. Um, so this is a very clear, direct, observable that tells us about what's going on in, in this system. And so it's uh, one of the main targets of what we do. And this program, as you know, is called Black Hole Spectroscopy. It's just ba really based on the fact that uh, because of the no hair theorem, the spectrum of a care black hole should depend only on the mass and the spin. So you have infinite, in principle, infinite modes of quasi-normal modes of vibration. All of their frequencies and damping rates are determined by just two parameters. So it's a highly overdetermined system. Um, and so if you have access to more than two, you can start making uh, consistency checks and try to see if you see a deviation. And if you see what you're looking at is, if you do, what you see is what is not a care black hole. Um, so you can sort of do this roughly in a way, in a very indirect way through these coefficients that I mentioned before. These alphas and betas are uh, controlling the ring down portion of these templates, but it's a very crude way of doing it. Um, and there's all sorts of nuances about the way the ring down is modeled in, in this, in, in this uh, sort of um, exercise and how the attachment is done. And so you're not really using the full uh, power of this description that we have that is very simple, which is that the emission at the late part should just be a superposition of these damp sinusoids with these frequencies that are defined uh, by the mass and the spin, and they have some dependence on the angular structure of the perturbation given by these angular um, numbers L and M attached to spheroidal harmonics. I won't go into this. Um, and you have for each uh, L and M, a uh, whole infinite ladder of modes ordered by their damping time uh, using this overton number N. So by definition, the uh, tau L and N is greater than or equal to the next one. So the higher N, the faster the modes decay. Um, okay, so none of these really, I mean, this is just based on if you work, work on black hole perturbation theory, this is how you will write it in practice. For people like me, this none of that really matters. It's in the end, what matters is that each uh, quasi each mode of vibration is really an elliptically polarized um, damp sinusoid. So you see, it's the, each mode is defined by these frequencies and damping rates. That's what defines the mode, and the, the, each of them has a characteristic amplitude and some ellipticity that controls the amount of basically plus and cross that you have um, at your detector. And so uh, you can visualize the structure of each of these modes as an ellipse in plus and cross space. And that ellipse has some semi-major axis given by this amplitude A and the semi-minor axis is given by epsilon A, the ellipticity. And it's tilted in H plus H cross space by some angle theta. And then the facing of the gravitational wave will be given by a phaser in this space, which is the red arrow. Uh, which will go around this ellipse as time goes by with frequency omega and starting at some, some fiducial reference, reference phase. And then as time goes by, this whole ellipse will shrink exponentially uh, with this characteristic decay rate, uh, and then the mode just vanishes. So you should imagine this arrow going around and then this ellipse just very quickly shrinking. And that's what we measure, um, uh, of course, just modulated by the antenna patterns that um, tell us what the sensitivity is of each detector uh, to each of these polarizations. So that's how we construct a template and we can try to fit that to the data that we see at the late part of our spiral merger ring down signals. Um, so we can, using this model, we can parameterize the frequencies in terms of the mass and the spin because we know we can, for any given mass and spin, we can predict what the frequencies are. And so we can um, invert this and try to measure the mass and spin from the data we observe. Um, and we can also introduce deviation parameters similar to what we talked about earlier that allow for the modes to float around um, the care prediction. 
And in so doing, by measuring these delta Fs and delta Taus, uh, we can provide a quantitative statement about agreement with care and the no hair theorem, I guess. Um, so it'd be great if we had a black hole and we could just throw MTW in there and just see it ring and we could excite all of these modes, but we, we can't. Of course, we have to extract these modes from actual noisy LIGO data. And so um, how do we do that? Well, there's two main strategies in, in, in our world to do this. Um, one is similar to what I talked about earlier, which is we can grab a full template for the whole evolution of the system and enhance that model with additional parameters that control the behavior at the end um, in a way that actually, uh, if, if you're doing this in a model that has quasi-normal modes built into it, you can actually parameterize this in terms of the frequencies and damping rates in the usual way. Uh, and so this is very neat because you have a whole an, a model for your whole signal and you just enrich this later part and try to allow for deviations in the ring down alone. Um, or the second sort of strategy, which is the one I've been proposing, is you literally just cut the data before the ring down and just look at the late data on its own and fit damp sinusoids. Um, so these two have um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, I'm running out of time, so probably I won't spend too much time into this. I mean, this enhanced IMR um, strategy is, uh, uh, is, is valid, but it has the disadvantage that you are necessarily coupling the ring down part to the spiral. And so if you see something off in the ring down, you don't know if it's because there was something wrong with the, your model for the spiral or for the attachment. Uh, but it does have the advantage that you can use regular uh, LIGO Virgo inference techniques. Uh, we can, you know, you can put this through our, our infrastructure very naturally. Whereas if you want to do the second kind of analysis that I mentioned, which is where you're cutting the signal in half, basically, um, that is basically impossible to do with the traditional LIGO Virgo infrastructure. And it has to do with the fact that if you want to analyze a signal, well, the usual way, um, you need to window your signal to actually Fourier transform it and work in the Fourier domain, which is where LIGO does everything. Everything in, in LIGO is done in the, four, in the frequency domain because the noise uh, covariance is diagonal. You can just divide by the PSD anyhow. If you, if you, if you, this, I love this. So if you're interested, you should talk to, talk to me. But the problem, in, in a nutshell, the issue is that if you want to cut and analyze just ring down data uh, that starts sharply at the beginning of your segment, you can't apply a window anymore uh, without corrupting the beginning of your ring down. And so a lot of thought has gone into how to actually do this. We eventually, I and others figured out how to do it properly in the time domain using what's called an acyclic toplitz matrix, it doesn't matter. But the end of the story is that we can just take a chunk of data and fit um, damp sinusoids directly without having to have a model for the what came before. Uh, these nuances matter. Like if you actually want to do an analysis like this, uh, talk to me, <laughs> I guess, uh, because if you don't get that right, you will get biases. So the point of this plot is to show you uh, that in the, the usual uh, the usual techniques, like what LIGO did for the 159014 paper, that technique is what is being used in the green um, case here, where I'm injecting a damp, uh, a damp sinusoid with this frequency and damping rate shown here. And you see that you get a bias um, because of these windowing issues and so on. Um, if you do what we've been doing since we corrected this, you get the red results. So we, we've learned how to do this better, but it was kind of hard. Um, okay, so technicalities aside, can we do this now? Uh, uh, yes, I will argue. <laughs> so uh, the, usual, uh, the usual perspective or ex expectation was that we must look very late after the peak to make sure that we are far away from nonlinearities or, or whatnot. Um, and that's bad because this, these signals decay very rapidly. Um, plus, if you want to obtain multiple modes, um, multiple 
um, fundamental modes of different LM dependence. Uh, all the modes except the quadrupole are very uh, are much uh, tend to be much weaker, and so this that makes it even harder to see. So the expectation was that we couldn't really do this. Um, however, if you want to take advantage of uh, overtones, you can go to like uh, to a slightly earlier regime, uh, and there we can show that there's hope to actually see these signals. Um, so if you see the fundamental mode of the quadrupolar mode and the first overtone then you can compare those two. There's also been very recently a claim of uh, detection of uh, two fundamental modes, the 2-2 and the 3-3 for 1905-21 by Capano et al. Uh, it's not my result, but uh, well, we can discuss it if you would like. But that's slightly different flavor than what I will tell you about. Um, anyhow, so what measurements have been presented? Um, well, this is, I think I presented this last time I talked at, uh, in Trieste. So we analyzed, uh, colleagues and I analyzed this Pino 914 at the peak. And we did that using a model that included the fundamental mode and the first overtone of the fundamental mode. And we obtained a measurement of the remnant mass and the X axis and the spin and the Y axis. And that gives us the measurement in yellow. Um, and that is consistent with what we get from the full analysis of the signal here. So this, this, this was neat. If you add an extra overtone, you don't really gain anything and you get the, the purple curve, which is what we expect when uh, the, over, the second overtone is not really visible. Uh, if you analyze it with no overtone, you get something biased because at the peak, this is a very bad model. Um, Okay, so I'm flying through this because I want to get to the end. Sorry to interrupt uh, again. Okay. Yeah. So the analysis, so, so that, that's the one done in the time domain then? Yeah. Is, okay. This is the first one that was done right. <laughs> I'm proud to say. Yeah, technically. I have impression yeah. the first uh, LIGO analysis was done in, they didn't have a discussion of, so, of, the, of this time domain issue. So was the original analysis done in the frequency domain or? Yeah, so the 15914 original analysis was done using a technique like the green one here. Okay. Um, I'm happy to discuss the details. And we can show that that analysis was fine, though, because the SNR was low mm -hmm. and the bias at that level, it should be okay because they, they didn't look exactly at the peak, they looked later and it should be okay. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't scale, right? And it would certainly not work with overtones. That's why we had to, okay. we had to do it correctly. Since then, the new LIGO of Virgo analysis do it correctly. So um, the GWTC2 results are fine, uh, technically speaking. Um, okay, so, sorry, I'm gonna, I don't know if you all have to go, but I wanna get, at the end, I have some common questions that I wanna answer, so. Um, let me just say that for that analysis, we reconstructed the fundamental mode, as you see here in, in, in orange, and the first overtone, as you see here in green. I don't think I've shown this before, but this is the actual measurement from 15 and 914. So you see the first overtone, um, you know, it's short lived, but we see roughly a cycle or so. Um, and we can compare their frequencies. Well, we can allow for deviations in the frequency of the overtone, and we can obtain a measure a constraint on this perturbation parameter, uh, delta F1, as shown here on the right. So this, uh, this yellow distribution comes from allowing for perturbations to the green mode here with respect to the curve prediction, and we obtain this measurement. It's a very broad measurement, but it shows that this sort of thing works. And since then, we have replicated this with numerical injections and then all sorts of studies that I'm happy to talk about at the end. Okay, we went crazy then after with this, we run, out, we run with this and we used it to test the area law by basically flipping the technique that we used to analyze the ring down. You can use it to analyze the spiral and cut at different times. And you can obtain, um, you can obtain measurements of the or projections for the remnant mass and spin or whatever parameters you want from different segments of the signal. And this was an example of that. I thought it was neat that we could generalize the technique to do other things, not just the ring down. 
Um, and since then, of course, as we, I was just alluding to, the LVC has done similar analyses as you see on the left. So this is done with uh, um, essentially the same numeric, the same time domain technique that I mentioned, but it's a completely different infrastructure. I'm not the one running these analyses, but I'm, I, I know about them, but I'm not the lead person. Um, and so here you see a number of events that were analyzed for from GWTC2. There's more analyzed, not just these. These are highlighted because they were the nicer ones, I guess. And then you can combine the measurements for the frequencies hierarchically, like I took a lot of time to explain to you and get a constraint combined from the from all these events uh, that's given here, the delta F2 to one um, plus minus 0.27 minus 0.32. Uh, and then you can, we also obtain constraints from the first technique that I mentioned, which is the enhanced IMR model. That, is, uh, that actually, I remind you, has a model for the full signal based on SUB. And then it allows for these delta F220 and delta tau220 parameters controlling the frequency and damping rate of the fundamental to two mode within this big model. And so what this, uh, this posterior on the right is doing is slightly different than the one on the left, right? It's, it's also, it's assessing consistency between the ring down and the, and the spiral as well, not just between ring down modes like it's being done here. Um, okay, so I flew through these results because I wanted to get, if you will allow me to some common questions that we usually get about these um, measurements and perhaps it will preempt some questions that you have. In your in your own heads. Um, so one of the questions we have gotten when trying to do these sort of spectroscopic studies with overtones is well, the natural reaction is well, these overtones fade very rapidly, and so they essentially look like delta functions, and you can fit anything with delta functions, right? So what you're doing is just uh, nonsense. Um, but well, first, if that was true none of this would work, right? Because if for a delta function, the frequency wouldn't matter. And there's no reason that you would actually get a measurement at all. This should look flat. There's other reasons uh, along these lines. Other things break if this was actually a delta function. Um, but more importantly, even the, if these overtones were delta functions, uh, they are all, there's no freedom of where to place the delta function, right? Like here, we're fitting them at the peak of the, of, of the of the strain. And, and if it's a delta function, it just controls one data point. If it's almost a delta function, maybe two. Uh, but we actually see that the presence or lack of overtone affects the whole set of, of, uh, uh, of, of times that we can resolve. So um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, furthermore, it's really not a delta function. We can actually measure it and reconstruct it we, I can inject all sorts of different uh, parameters for the overtone and I can recover its amplitude and so on. So it's, it, I don't think this holds on, holds up. Um, okay, next, there's uh, an expectation that you would need, it's like, okay, the overtones are there, but the frequencies are very close. So the frequency of the first overtone and the fundamental mode are very close to each other. So you would need a very large SNR to actually measure these frequencies. Uh, and that really, arises from a misconception, as far as I can tell, uh, that says th that it's the expectation that to actually resolve frequencies of damp sinusoids, you need them to be well separated. So it's this Riley-like heuristic that you see here stated on the left. So that the difference in the, in the true frequencies should be larger than the maximum of their standard deviations. That's true for sinusoids, but it's not true for damp sinusoids, right? Because we can actually use the damping rate to differentiate the two modes, as you see here as an example on the right. Uh, so on the right, there's two damp sinusoids injected in, in, in data that have very similar frequencies, but different damping rates. And these are the parameters like 415 and 14. And the, the analysis, the Bayesian analysis that fits both of them at once, there's no problem distinguishing the fact that there's two modes and it can measure its, its times, its damping rates, and its frequencies. And the frequency marginals, the one-dimensional PDFs on the top, totally overlap, but there's no confusion here. It knows which is which, and the measurements of the frequencies are well-defined regardless. In fact, you can have two modes that have exactly the same frequency, 
and different damping rates and the same story, story holds. So this heuristic is not necessarily uh, valid. So it's not, not true that we need SNR 100 to do this. Um, furthermore, you can actually, I can actually show you that if we change the frequency of the overtone and we simulate that, we can actually measure that. And so that's what's shown here on the right, different uh, values for this perturbation parameter, delta F221. I simulate a signal that has plus 0.5, minus 0.5 and I can measure that better or worse, depending on the SNR, but nonetheless. Um, okay, final question, I think. So you, you can identify modes by the damping rate, as I just said, but you don't measure the, the fractional deviation in the damping rate very well. So how come, right? Because if you, if you look at the measurement for 15 and 14, for example, we get, get some kind of measurement for the frequency parameter but for the damping rate, it's very lousy. And this is generally always true that this delta tau is very hard. It's harder to measure. Uh, so it seems to contradict what I just said. Um, but in reality, that's also a confusion, I think, because the fact that we can separate modes in time doesn't mean that our relative precision in the width of the distributions in time is very good. So absolute precision is not the same as relative precision. So for this example on the right, we can separate these modes in the tau, in terms of tau very well, but if you were to look at the fractional width of these distributions, uh, the posterior that you get is very, very, very broad, right? So we can only determine that delta tau parameter to like 30 plus minus 30%, which is doesn't sound very good at all, even though here it looks like a good measurement. Uh, and that's just the fact that relative precision is not the same as absolute precision. So that that's it. Um, then, okay, this is the last one, I promise. A two-tone model should not work at the peak. So it's like, okay, everything you've said so far is fine, but we know that just the fundamental mode and the overtone should not work at the peak where you, these analyses are all carried out. For all these analyses, we're truncating the data at the peak and fitting there. Um, but that, that's a usual uh, thing that we do in data analysis, this whenever the, the systematic bias from modeling the signal is smaller than the statistical uncertainty, this doesn't matter. And we can actually predict with injections, I can show you that the effect of additional things in that, are, that are there in the signal, but are not visible at this, the SNRs that we see for 15 and 14, it only come, becomes really important when you have SNRs of 50 or 70 or 100 or so. So it's technically true, this is not the whole story, but the, the additional modes or nonlinearities or whatever don't contribute to a measurable degree. Okay, so thanks again for indulging me with that. I hope maybe you were wondering about some of those things. I'm happy to revisit them, but this thing brings me to a close. Um, so I wanted to, I really gave you a whirlwind tour of, of, of the big, world that is testing GR with LIGO and Virgo. And I picked these two things that I like to think about, which is how do we actually gain from the many, many detections that we have uh, in a smart way, how we actually extract that information uh, without tricking ourselves into thinking we're doing better than we actually are by, by using statistical hierarchical techniques. And I chose to tell you about ring downs because there's a lot going on uh, in that regime and it's my favorite thing. Um, but anyhow, more and better detections uh, will up the game for tests of general relativity. We can do better because we see better detections and we can combine them to also make better statements and different uh, statements of different quality. Um, specifically, black hole spectroscopy can give us a particularly clean way to learn about strong gravity. I hope I convince you. Uh, and that now we have the techniques analytically to actually do that. And in the future, as we get actually very loud ring downs, this will be very important. Um, and there are many open questions and opportunities for innovation in this field. There's actually a lot of questions that we don't know. Like how, do the, how does the fact that we detect these signals with GR templates affect this, this, the statements we can make or uh, all sorts of things that <laughs> we need to think about. Um, and as we are speaking, LIGO is analyzing the second half of the third observing run, which has many, many more detections. And in the future, next year, we'll have the fourth observing run, which will really be overwhelming in the amount of quality and quantity 
of science that we, we can do. So this is very exciting um, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thanks a lot. This was a very interesting talk. Enrico already asked a few things. Um, what, are, what are questions? Straight ahead. If not, I will just start with one. In the in the in one of the earlier slides where you showed the constraints on the deviation um, on the different positonian parameters and in the ring down, um, it seemed that there was not much improvement in the second in the second color law compared to the first one when it came to the ring down. Um, yeah, on the right hand side, if I understood that correctly, when you show the points. So it's almost the same with the first uh, CWTC1 catalog. Is it because the W1509.14 was so good in some sense? Yeah. So, okay. So these are not just the ring down. They are, okay. So the betas control more, more the attachment between the the ring down and, and you know the plunge and, and merger part and then the alphas control the ring down through something like a Lorentzian. Um, yeah it's hard to say I actually don't really know exactly what is driving the new constraints but you're right that we haven't we, we don't seem to have gained too much here um, it can't yeah <laughs> it's just I guess the heavier events didn't really help um, yeah yeah, I don't, I don't know what event okay. is driving that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, other questions? If nobody asks a question or while others think about possible questions, maybe I can, I mean, it's not a question, it's more, I wanted to elaborate more on what I uh, was asking or commenting before. So say, take the case of hier hier hierarchical Bayesian inference for the ring down. So you take again, the, uh, you assume that deviations from, from GR follow some Gaussian distribution. And yes, you, as you have more events, you may, ha you may add the higher order moments of that PDF at the, the cortosis or whatever they're called, at the higher order moments. However, one, one similar thing, or, or though physically, I think, more motivated and still theory agnostic would be to say, suppose my deviations from GR are an unknown function of the final spin and final mass, because this is what you know characterize the final black hole element. There might be additional parameters, but at the very least, those deviations uh, depend on the A final and final. And then you say, and these deviations, instead of being given by a Gaussian, they are some generic function of those. And then you do a Taylor expansion. And you have lots of parameters, of course, when you do this Taylor expansion. But on the other hand, as you were mentioning, in 04 or 05, you have up to one event per week or per day. I don't know how many. So you have uh, lots and lots of events. So maybe there is hope to, 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 even though you have many more parameters than just two mu and sigma, maybe there's hope to, to, to reconstruct them. And this would be, I think, more physically motivated than, than I mean, it's similar in spirit. Yeah, so what if what you're doing, yeah, it's totally fine. So you can reparameterize the problem in terms of other quantities that you can actually say are shared. That's essentially what you're doing is saying these delta Fs or delta Taus are not will not be the same for all events, but I can write those as functions of some coefficients that will be the same because they are controlling some power, some function of form of the of this distribution. Right. And then you can do what you said. Uh, and that's fine if you if you if you know if you trust that you know how to expand that that's that's also valid and it, what you've done is, is is change the perspective so you can actually work with quantities that you you can treat as being the same for all the events essentially so that's good uh, but it comes at the price as you said of more quantities or yeah, so actually, like putting some that would be would be weaker so it would be in that figure you showed would be yeah, so they will be weaker. So clearly, the, the, the width of the posteriors will be smaller if you have uh, just a Gaussian. Yeah, well, it will be harder to compare because you will be measuring something slightly different, right? So you won't be able to just compare one. Like, you will have some posteriors on these parameters that control right. this function, right? And so that's, that's valid. But then if you want to translate it into these 
uh, like, I don't know, these, these new parameters don't have any meaning anymore. Uh, so, yeah. so it's, a, it's a different test. So that's good. So there are, there are um, you could construct some sort of like PPE or PN expansion an analog for the ringdown, like Maselli and, and maybe you are in that paper. Too. I don't know who else is in that paper. Um, and so we, we, could, we could try to do that. Yeah, I think Bernard Bertie has a paper on this, right? Where he explains the 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 potential. He has deviations from the in the potential parameterized by some unknown coefficients, and then he tries to yeah uh, yeah. So yeah. they they the way I, I think about this, the, the hierarchical analysis is the most agnostic thing when you, you don't know anything and it's always right. Um, mm -hmm. If you do have other input from physics that you are willing, you say, well, this is a reasonable thing to do. And you can further constrain that and, and or you can parameterize it in a more reasonable way. That's great. Um, so that's also, but it's, a, it's, a, it's asking a more specific, yeah, right. more, more aimed question. Um, whatever it is, um, this there will be a distribution in some high dimension, let's say it's mass and spin and deviation space. And there's some function there that you don't know from the, your theory of GR, the non-GR theory tells you what that is. And then the moment you project it onto just the delta F, delta tau space, you will have some distribution that we can measure the mu and sigma from. So, so this hierarchical thing, you know, I it's like a catch all <laughs> situation. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah. So when I said it's the only way to do it, what I meant, it's the only way without any. No, no, no. What you're saying is valid. Absolutely. I, mean, yeah. I was just curious whether I was trying to do this. Yeah. This is like if you're a dumb data analyst like I am, I, you don't want to, you know, commit to any given <laughs> theory. You yeah, can, but, you can in a blind uh, sort of way do this. <laughs> yeah. I think to do. Yeah. Um, but at least you are you know that you are not tricking yourself mm -hmm. because if you do the other the other way people have been doing things uh you know you start multiplying posteriors and you see it get better and better and you're like wow this is great <laughs> it, it it doesn't work right like imagine you have a bunch of distributions like like this on the right and in in truth gr is wrong and the true values are scattered equally to the left and the right. And then you start multiplying all these distributions, you'll get something that is peaking at zero and you think GR is correct, but in reality, it's not. <laughs> and so an analysis like this would catch that because the sigma of the distribution would not be consistent with zero, even though the, mu the mean is. So um, yeah, so this is another art tool in our arsenal, but it definitely doesn't rule out doing more. In yeah, in a different way, the, uh, yeah, it, it's an out test. I mean, if you get sigma different from zero, then you can explore. Uh, yeah, it is. It is an out test, and essentially, it's an out test in this space. Well, it's an out test. Yeah, yeah, and we can. So, if, if if mu and sigma are consistent with zero, then it's all good. If it's yeah. not, then we can, we have to figure out why. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. That's so so interesting. Um, I think we're twelve minutes over time now. Uh, it's, it was very nice. And then let's close it here. Thank you very much again. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Maybe you get an email with more questions. Yes, please. Let's see. Okay, then.